a section on 3D modeling. So we're going to be thinking about um, using uh, Rhino 7 uh, in uh, the next uh, five videos. Um, and uh, I wanted to give you all just a quick heads up um, that during this particular set of videos that you may see me kind of uh, my uh, image camera kind of float in and out um, on the screen, um, but that narration is still going to be there. Um, and the reason for that is just because, uh, you, as you'll see soon, um, when we get into Rhino, uh, the screen uh, real estate becomes really precious. Um, so I just wanted to give you a heads up uh, ahead of time that you may see me uh, disappear and reappear um, or uh, just have my uh, my own, you know, kind of image be completely uh, absent from some of the videos um, because I need the screen space. So uh, without further ado, let's jump into, uh, into Rhino and we'll start uh, kind of thinking through some of the uh, basics uh, of the interface. So uh, I'll see you there in a, in a flash. All right, well, uh, we're going to go ahead and get Rhino going. So I'm going to come down uh, obviously to the taskbar um, and start it up. And um, you can see here that I've got a couple of models that I've been working on recently for my own sort of uses. Um, and uh, you also have the option to use uh, templates. We'll talk about templates later in the uh, in today's session. So um, I also uh, have uh, the option to create a new model, and that's what I'm going to go ahead and do right now. Um, we need sorry, oh, cat just opened a door. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that for now uh, to just kind of give us a blank workspace. And uh, this is basically what you see. Um, because of the uh, video resolution, I'm not going to be able to provide uh, sort of like the full uh, window. I'm missing about a quarter inch on the bottom. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put myself over this for now because I don't think we're going to be using it uh, right away. Um, and I'm just going to change the, the screen setup slightly um, to try to uh, grab the bottom of the, nope, not that, not that, might not be able to do it. Um, hang on just a second. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this will be better because uh, we can see this uh, readout on the on the bottom, and I may have to kind of shift it up and down uh, a couple of times, um, but uh, for now I think this will do just fine. Uh, we'll keep it here. Um, so we are missing uh, a couple of key things, so I'm definitely going to have to shift it uh, back and forth. Um, to in order to show uh, some stuff that's on the bottom or or the top um, so right I'm gonna aim for the top right now actually okay so as I said you may see the screen uh, shift uh, from top to bottom just a, a little bit and um, that's uh, just because the uh, video aspect ratio isn't hundred percent lining up uh, with my with my window um, and it's impossible for it to do that. So um, so as we get into Rhino, I guess the first thing that I want to really address is um, the sort of basic environment. And so what you see uh, when we kind of come in here is the sort of default setup. Um, so this is the same thing that you should be seeing um, if you're using Rhino for the first time. So you have a, a set of four views that should be visible to you, um, the top, the front, the right, and the perspective. Um, we're going to talk about how to kind of change all this stuff, but I'm just kind of like at this point naming things. So these are called your view viewports. Um, you also have a sort of side tab over here uh, where I am. And that you can see right now has a properties palette and then also a layers palette. Um, we will be using both of these things uh, eventually, but uh, you can show and hide this side palette um, by clicking this button right here. So if we click that, they'll go away. 
And um, the nice thing about kind of sh being able to show and hide your side palette is that it gives you more real estate in your viewports. Um, so particularly because you have four viewports, um, or most people choose to work in the four viewport layout, then, uh, you know, each one, of course, becomes correspondingly smaller, the more the, the more of them that you have. So um, you do have some uh, some other options, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. Um, the other thing that we see uh, right now that's kind of pretty important is this large tool, uh, large toolkit over here. So um, this has, uh, it, it doesn't look like it does much, but it actually does because each one of these little um, tools, if you hold it down, it's got like 20 things in it. Um, and they're all sort of um, like that. So they're grouped into ca categories. Um, so this, for example, is everything having to do with, with straight lines. Um, this is everything having to do with control point curves. And you can see there's many, uh, many functions there that you could uh, potentially use. So we'll get into all of, uh, pretty much most of this um, uh, tool set, I think, um, within the, you know, the next five videos. Um, up here, you have a kind of like a uh, tool, sort of general toolkit that has to do with, you know, file management, saving, printing, if you would ever want to do that. Um, navigation tools are also uh, up here. They kind of stay there. Um, and then uh, these are uh, work, work uh, excuse me, viewport uh, tools. Um, so those are like quick access to choosing different viewports. Um, and then, of course, uh, here we have some other things. So these are related to materials and layers and lighting. Uh, lighting over here, and then we also have um, the sort of uh, shading, rendering. Um, so most of these are really, uh, this whole row up here are really related to like, uh, not modeling specifically, but they're related to the environment, um, and they're related to what you may do with your file um, after you model it. So there's also sort of like a list of, just a list of stuff up here. And if we go to one of these menus, like Curve Tools, for example, um, what you get in this menu of Curve Tools is sort of, and you can see this menu also shifted, these are sort of special purpose menus. And, you know, you're more than welcome to explore them if you want, but we're going to be using the standard uh, menu in, in the, these five videos. And what you get if you go to Curve Tools is really just kind of a shortcut to everything that you would see in the Curve menu anyway. Um, so I think just working with these menus, we're going to have our hands full. Um, but, uh, you know, you can maybe just know that there's some special, special magic up, up in here. <laughs> so um, now that being said, um, the other sort of um, thing that we need to think about when we're working with uh, navig navigation around the workspace, particularly, is um, I'm going to move down here. Um, would be the idea that you need to uh, kind of have something on the screen or have something done in order to sort of, you know, move around and, and, you know, otherwise we're just going to be looking at a, looking at an empty grid and that's not so exciting. So I'm going to start um, kind of jump, jumping ahead a few clicks um, to kind of get something done. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use this solid menu. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and choose one of these uh, solids. Um, I'm not going to choose a sphere because that wouldn't illustrate uh, rotation very well because it would appear exactly the same. Um, I think let's go for a tube right now. Um, and so we can uh, make it's now you can see when we click on, you know, um, a shape tool that it's going to give us uh, a, se a series of prompts. So right now it's asking for the base of the tube. And it gives us a little hint there that that's going to be a point. So how would we define a point in Rhino? Well, we would click it. And uh, right now I have everything kind of set up, uh, you know, appropriately. I can just click anywhere, um, although we can get a little more precise about this later on. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and click anywhere. I'm going to give it a radius. So 
these these uh, grid lines, by the way, do correspond to some unit. Um, even though we didn't specify what they are, that's also coming later. Right now, I'm just going to eyeball it so we have something on the screen. And then it asks you for a sort of inner radius. Um, and then it asks you to specify the end of the tube. So this is where, now we're sort of getting into three dimensions here. So this is where you can sort of see the, the front viewport becoming useful versus the top viewport. So if you've ever had any exposure to architecture, you can think of the top viewport as the plan uh, viewport and the front and right as the elevation. Um, so great, so now I have uh, a sort of a thing that I can play with and that we can move around. Um, you may be asking yourself, how am, I, how am I moving it around? Well, so now that we have this thing on the screen, I think we can start to talk about um, using multi-touch um, to kind of navigate through the workspace. Or uh, if you are kind of old school, or uh, <laughs> if you really care about ergonomics, you could potentially look into excuse me, uh, getting a getting a three button mouse. Um, so I think working with your trackpad is fine if you're on the go and you know, you want to get something done quickly. Um, if you're working uh, at home and you're working in long sessions, um, the trackpad can become kind of uh, ergonomically, you know, not great. <laughs> um, so sometimes you could just find yourself, you know, like, ah, like, cramped up. Um, so if that's uh, happening, um, I would certainly consider getting a wireless three button mouse. Um, now, I'm going to assume that people are mostly using their trackpads. So if you have uh, the pinch um, in any viewport, the two, two, two finger pinch um, is going to give you uh, a zoom zoom in and zoom out. And that's going to work in every viewport. Now, some of these viewports, um, the perspective viewport, for example, is a little bit special. So the multi-touch works slightly differently in the perspective viewport. So let's go ahead and, and work on the others. So you can also do a two finger slide and that is going to allow you to pan. So that allows you to move the, the sort of stuff without uh, changing the shape shape or position of the of the viewport window and that's going to work in every every viewport as well um, except in perspective um, when you're using perspective and you do that sort of two-fingered slide it is actually going to allow you to rotate the view um, and uh, if you hit your the shift key um, in the perspective view, that is going to allow you to use the two button, the two fingered slide as the pan, which is how it works in the other three viewports. So, so that's pretty much in a nutshell the way multi touch works. Um, you know, of course, you can also um, use a control uh, the right click. Um, so, if you're on a three button mouse, I'll just go uh, through some things really quickly. Um, if you're on a three button mouse, the uh, right click should allow you to pan. Um, the wheel uh, al allows you to zoom and the uh, left click um, actually in perspective would give you that spinning uh, effect. So that's nice. I mean, it's uh, just sort of stuff that um, we have to kind of go through and definitely stuff that if you, if you don't take a couple minutes to kind of figure out how to move around things, um, it's going to be extremely difficult to use Rhino. So um, so I would actually just, um, you know, every if you've got a chance to do it, just make some quick shape, um, pick something from the solid menu, um, and see if you can get a shape down there. And pl take a couple minutes and play around with the, with the, with the interface, because it is um, definitely uh, different, uh, especially if you're not used to working um, in a 3D uh, software, which of course the assumption is that you aren't. Um, so, so yeah, I would I would definitely start here. 
Okay, so um, in, ter in terms of workplace setup, there's a uh, kind of, we're going to be spending pretty much most of this first video with uh, setup related uh, matters. And uh, I can't say that this is probably the most exciting Rhino video I have ever made, um, but I think it's all really, really important because if you don't have the setup done correctly, you can kind of um, end up with a file that is or a design that's pretty much useless. Um, and we don't want that to happen to anybody. So uh, so we're going to take a little extra time to go through some of the setup stuff. OK, so as I said before, we're going to um, kind of think about um, some of these viewport layouts. And uh, right now, you can see we've got the sort of classic four port viewport. So that's a top, uh, a front, a right, and then a perspective. Um, you may find that you don't need the front and the right, um, but uh, I would personally, I would stick with the four port layout, uh, especially if you're learning. Um, and the reason for that is because you actually, when you're drawing in Rhino, um, I'll demonstrate just with a line. Um, when you're drawing in Rhino, you need to be able to know where it is on the top, like on the plan, the sort of flat plane. And then you also need to know where it is up here, right, um, in this plane. And you also may need to know where it is um, even on this plane. Um, and so you kind of need to look at all three viewports at once um, if you're sort of thinking about where, where you want to put things or if you're drawing, quote unquote, you know, freehand. Um, so, so I think you may find it useful to keep the four viewports for now. Um, one thing that you can do really quickly, which I find super useful, is you can toggle through the singular viewports. So if you wanted to, for example, like work in the top view and make a complicated shape, and you wanted to be able to uh, take that top view and make it sort of fill the screen uh, and maximize your real estate temporarily, um, you can toggle to any sort of single um, viewport. And then you can go back to your four port layout um, by clicking this little four button thing. Um, one thing also just to kind of like note about the viewports is um, later we're going to start doing some things like rendering and maybe even saving uh, snapshots of some of these 3D shapes, um, you want to note that there is an active viewport. So in this case right now, because we've clicked in this viewport and we're doing stuff in it, um, the top viewport is the active viewport right now. So uh, over here, if we want to click over on perspective and make the perspective view the active viewport, um, all we need to do is just click this kind of top area. So going to go back to this. You can also kind of get to it from by clicking here, which is fine also. Um, so that may not be readily apparent right now, but um, there are many, uh, many functions in Rhino that will ask you what, the, what is your active viewport. Um, and some of it has to do with, uh, let's say you wanted to rotate something in in this viewport, um, in other words, make have like a flat um, 360 degree radius. Well, you certainly wouldn't want it to rotate, you know, in here because it would be completely wrong, obviously. So, um, so yeah, there's some stuff like that that you just need to know which uh, is your active viewport. So, um, I'm going to spend uh, just a little bit of time uh, talking about basic uh, shapes. And um, this is sort of um, the sort of basic shape thing that I'm going to do is uh, a little bit of a tutorial about the hierarchy of form in Rhino. And so uh, you can see right now we have our sort of blank viewport. Um, I am going to uh, just use the default grid right now. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make uh, a literally a line. Um, and, you know, a line is, well, you can technically make point objects in Rhino, but you may not want to uh, for various reasons. Um, 
And uh, the line is pretty much as, as simple as you can get in Rhino. Um, I'm going to enable one feature that right now is uh, on the screen. So I wanted this to be uh, this bar up here to be accessible. This bar contains some really important um, interface stuff related to this palette. Um, but the easiest of these so-called snaps, we'll be talking about snaps a lot because they um, really kind of dictate where things go um, in Rhino and a certain they also can dictate a level of precision um, that you need if you're, uh, you know, using um, Rhino for any kind of um, uh, any kind of you, sort of purpose where you want to actually make something or design something um, that might actually exist in the real in the real or virtual world. <laughs> so it's pretty important. Um, the the grid snap is probably the most straightforward. It allows us to snap to the grid, um, and we've seen uh, you know there's a grid snap function in Photoshop. Um, it's uh, we've used snapping on the uh, the Premiere timeline. So the sort of concept of snapping it should, uh, is not necessarily new to us. Um, now that I have snapping enabled, you can see that um, I can uh, sort of click through uh, the points and I can just basically ensure that my line is straight um, and it's asking us to do a, a sort of like next point um, and so we can certainly turn this into a polyline um, but right now it's a uh, it's just a line and I think that's how we're gonna leave it so this is a polyline right now you can see it's got more than one point more than two points um, we can also make uh, a sort of uh, shape if we wanted to make a two-dimensional shape. Uh, we can make a curve. Uh, so this is a this is a, a curve or a vector of a rectangle, and that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so this is an open an open line or an open curve. This is a closed uh, closed line, uh, also known as a two-dimensional shape. Uh, and then uh, from here, we can start to get into um, this sort of hierarchy. And so if I just cut and paste that, um, and I go to, uh, let's say, the surface menu, which is up at the very top, and I'm going to select um, this method of creating uh, a surface, which is called planar curves. What are planar curves? Put simply, they're curves that are coplanar. They're on the same plane. Um, so we could double check um, here, but I mean, you can see from just a very cursory examination that they do appear to be on the same plane. So we can use planar curves. So now what I've done is I've taken this this line. This line has become a closed shape, and then from a closed shape, which is co happens to be coplanar, um, I am now making a, a surface. So what is a surface, you may be asking. Well, you can see I got these sort of imaginary curves here. Right now we can't really tell the difference between this and this other than looking at this sort of cross, uh, these cross lines, which those do kind of in Rhino denote a surface. Um, a surface is basically something that has uh, the ability to have light reflect off of it. Also, something that you may want to know about the surface, a surface, any surface, is that it has no thickness. It doesn't have, it's not a solid. So we're going to really clearly, um, you know, draw into what the difference is between these things. Um, but these are just some sort of basic uh, kind of term terminology and concepts that we want to kind of work with. So I'm going to real quickly um, select my active viewport and I'm going to change the view mode. I'm just going to put this in shaded right now because um, it looks like it's in wireframe. And by putting it into a shaded viewport, you can see now that the surface 
has something that this doesn't have. Um, and that is that it has that ability for light to uh, reflect off of it and also for light for, you know, things not to pass through it. But it is super flat. Um, it has no sort of dimension in the Z, um, in this case, in the Z. So it's not, it's not like a thing that you can touch or grab. It's like a, it's like a, like a sheet, like a paper thin sheet. Um, so we can certainly now take this surface and do some things to it. So we could consider um, going to actually make it a solid. So I'm going to kind of jump in here, and this is jumping ahead a little bit just to kind of get things done to show you. So I'm going to take the surface and ex extrude curve straight. Um, we'll be doing this multiple times. Okay, so this is the curve that I want to extrude. And then it asks me to set an extrusion distance. And I don't think I want to go too crazy here. Um, maybe something like that seems good. And so now you can see that if I just move this over a bit, Um, now you can see that I have a line, I have a closed curve, I have a surface, and I also have this kind of open, um, this open uh, shape. So this open shape is called a, a poly surface, and that's that's a really important piece of terminology. So a poly surface is not necessarily solid. In other words, you can see this poly surface is kind of open. You can pass through it. Um, but a poly surface is really no more than a collection of surfaces that are touching. Um, so you can see in this case there are four surfaces that are touching, right? Now, if we want to go sort of like the next step in this uh, Rhino's kind of hierarchy of form, I can uh, just duplicate this with by cutting and pasting quickly. And there's actually a, a command uh, in Rhino to make something uh, a solid. And so that is uh, cap planar holes. So what that's going to do is, is it'll cap the top and the bottom. Okay, so so again, we kind of jumped a little bit ahead um, on some stuff, uh, but we'll be going back around to kind of uh, fill in some gaps. But what I wanted to show you was I wanted to get this out of that um, process. And so this is basically the hierarchy of form in Rhino. So you have a, an open line or an open curve. Um, you have a closed curve also known as a shape. Um, and then you have a single surface. Surfaces can be all sorts of different shapes. Um, you know, there's a lot of, this is like the most basic example. Then you have an open poly surface, right? And then this is what is called a solid. Um, and so we can, so we sort of did it the, the hard way. We did it the long way. I'm going to show you at this point the easy way to make solids, and that is to go to this solid menu, um, and you can go to this uh, solid menu, and you can do, you know, any of these things. You can also take a closed planar curve, hint, hint, and uh, go ahead and extrude it or, you know, give it dimension um, with a couple of different methods. So. Um, Probably one of the best solids to work with, um, especially if you're new, is just the box. Um, so you can certainly work, uh, this one is probably the easiest, the corner to corner height. So let's go ahead and make a box. Um, I'm going to put it uh, over here just uh, as a sort of like tower kind of thing. 
and let's say other corner of base or length. So uh, that is, you know, sort of setting the platform for the box. So I'm just going to click here. Um, and then it asks me to set the height. Now I'm in the top viewport right now. So it doesn't seem like the top viewport would be a real smart place to set the height. I would probably want to be in the front or the right. Um, so I can, I can do that. I can just kind of come in here. And um, I'm going to go ahead and just make a, the box like one cell of the grid for no reason in particular. Um, but then you can see I have a fully formed box. And um, I think if you're looking to sort of get started in Rhino and you're feeling overwhelmed, I think that working with solids is actually one of the best uh, ways that you can get things down quickly. Um, because I can now take this. I can take this box and I can, you know, sort of like turn it into other stuff um, just by um, just by repeating it and uh, just by um, kind of stacking. And of course, you know, this could go on literally forever. Um, and then, you know, you have these sort of more complicated shapes from simple shapes. Um, you could put smaller boxes, you know, on here. Um, so, so I think if um, I, I do have uh, every semester, I have a, um, you know, a small number of students who really struggle with Rhino. Um, and I actually don't know that it's struggling with Rhino so much as it is struggling with the idea of three dimensional design. Um, and so my sort of like number one piece of advice, if you're feeling like you're having trouble translating what's in your mind's eye to Rhino, uh, which is definitely, you know, a task, um, I would consider breaking things down into small shapes. So um, I may do uh, some uh, other demos in the future where we actually kind of think about that process. Um, but uh, I guess sort of like put, you know, simply like if you're trying to model just, you know, a simple object, don't try to model the bottle, right? Um, try to model a cylinder, right? And then a cone and then another cone and then a little cylinder, right? So in other words, break it down into small shapes. Um, and you may find that that's um, pretty helpful um, because there is no, uh, no way to sort of just model a car or model, model you know, an airplane. You're always taking, uh, taking things and describing them in simple shapes and then adding complexity or adding details. Um, so I hope that's a little bit helpful anyway. Um, now that we have some of these basic shapes uh, thrown down here, I think uh, one thing that we also want to talk about before we kind of move on to more drawing um, is the idea of view modes. And so we have, uh, we did switch a view mode. I don't know if you noticed, but we changed this to shaded. Um, and by by changing it to shaded, it allowed me to see the difference between this sort of two-dimensional shape and uh, some of these other sort of shapes that are made of surfaces. So uh, this is sort of the magical menu button here for your sort of viewport um, rendering mode. Um, you may find that um, some of these viewports are uh, rend some of these modes will actually uh, allow you to have um, a little bit better performance uh, in terms of things, you know, kind of refreshing on the screen quickly. So certainly the quickest is the wireframe viewport, um, which we started on. The wireframe viewport has the has the benefit of rendering super quickly. Um, it has the downside of, you know, not really being able to see what's going on. So if you're working in a, in a way that's very sort of structural um, or just sort of um, drafting, um, I think the wireframe viewport is great. Um, when you start to 
think about surfaces and solids, um, the wireframe viewport uh, is not so great. So the shaded viewport is also fairly quick. Um, and the reason it's fairly quick is that you can see there's not a lot of complexity in the in the light and the way the light hits the objects. It's a single color. Um, it has some notion of light, but not not really. Um, so a mode that I use a lot for my own work when I'm kind of working on stuff is the ghosted viewport. Uh, and I really like the ghosted mode because it allows me to see inside of things. Um, so if I wanted to, for example, like click this point, um, if I'm in a shaded viewport, I wouldn't really know where it is. Um, but um, when I'm working in the ghosted viewport, um, it's, uh, it's sort of, uh, things are literally a little bit transparent. So um, that can be useful too, and it's pretty fast. Um, modes that are not fast, modes that uh, may look really cool, and you may certainly use them, but they may not, um, they, they may be like super slow. Um, the so-called rendered viewport, I don't recommend working in the rendered viewport unless you're starting to experiment with uh, lighting and um, some of the uh, material properties and some of those other things. Um, so you may not get yourself into the rendered viewport, in other words, until you're done with your file and working on a rendering, um, not a sort of drawing or a model. So um, we, may, uh, we may use the rendering viewport as a preview tool when we start uh, assigning some of those characteristics that are good for rendering. But until you really get into rendering, I wouldn't use it because it might look cool, but it's going to slow things down quite a bit. Um, likewise, the ray traced viewport is also going to slow things down. Um, as you can see right now, it takes time just to you know get it rendered on the screen. Um, so this is really um, intended to be a preview for uh, people who are doing uh, rendering with ray tracing. So I wouldn't uh, use this mode um, as a sort of like practical thing. And then there are some uh, some other viewports that are kind of fun, um, like the art. I love the artistic viewport. And of course, you can see that's my beach ball of death. Um, because it didn't like so much the ray traced viewport. Uh, so this is the artistic um, artistic mode. Anyway, I mean you can um, sort of explore these at your leisure. Um, there's a couple more where it may be worth mentioning: the pen viewport, uh, the technical viewport. I actually do kind of like the technical viewport. Um, because it uh, gets rid of the grid and it uh, gives you some notation of the backside of things. Um, but uh, it's definitely made for capturing two-dimensional drawings from the perspective view. Um, so uh, if you're thinking about that, you can uh, export uh, like these, these views as PDF files. Um, and then you can, you know, use them as like a supplement or an illustration in a document or something like that. So, view modes are done. Um, now, before we go any further, I'm going to go back into the shaded uh, viewport just to kind of like get it back to where I like it to be. Um, and again, I think if you're, I think if you're learning, I think this is probably the best, the best viewport. Um, rendering mode to work in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and reset these other ones back to uh, wireframe. So, um, you know, different strokes for different folks. Some people really like the shaded. Um, some people like the wireframe. Um, but certainly when you're building the forms and building your model, I think those are sort of the main two modes that you would want to work in. 
So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and open up a new file. And um, because when I open up that new file, I'm going to use a template. So we do wanna talk a little bit about templates. And then we're gonna talk about the grid, and then we'll talk about snapping. So new, rather new using template, here we go. Okay, so um, I think these small objects, inches, uh, feet, uh, feet and inches, is a pretty good sort of like general template that works for most people. Um, I personally like the one that's just inches because I don't think in terms of feet, um, it's a little too uh, imperial measurement for me. Um, of course, if you're making something for a 3D printer, uh, you may want to consider working in small objects millimeters uh, because many, many 3D printers, including the ones that we have here in the lab, um, will actually uh, kind of, uh, their default is to work in, mil in millimeters. Um, so it's a, it's a simple conversion to c convert from inches to millimeters, but it's good to it's good to not have to do that and to get get it right um, the you know the first time. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and work in inches because I think um, for most people um, who are uh, kind of living in the United States that that's the most kind of common um, common unit. Um, but certainly if you're a scientific type or if you're working, um, you know, in an environment that uh, uses millimeters, uh, go for it. I don't mind. So, um, make that the default template. Okay, so... So what you can see here now is that we have this new template, it's inches. So we're on a slightly different um, grid, it looks like. So I could potentially um, draw some conclusions about this grid, but I'm probably not going to. Um, I'm probably going to just go ahead and go into settings. And um, within this settings uh, palette window thing, um, the first thing I'm going to do is just verify that my units are in inches. And so they indeed are. So I'm going to click these two tabs and make sure that my units are there. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to address the grid. And it looks like this is actually a pretty great grid um, that it defaulted to, so that's nice. Um, I usually find myself having to set up my own grid. So this has a grid line count of 200, which is basically the you know, total number of lines over the entire grid. Um, if you need a b bigger grid, um, you probably don't actually want a bigger grid. You probably want more grid lines. Um, so this would be the way to actually make your grid, grid expand larger over the world. Um, and we have a minor grid lines every 20.25 inches, otherwise known as a quarter inch and then major grid lines every four minor grid lines. So this is fantastic. This is basically a one inch to uh, quarter inch uh, quadrille grid. So um, this should be really easy to work with. Um, and you may notice here we have the snap spacing. This is a really useful parameter if you're using the grid snap, um, which we had went ahead and enabled it earlier. So if you're using grid snap um, and you want to uh, set this to an inch, you could. Um, and so just know that that's there. I'm going to keep it on a quarter inch because it seems most useful. Um, so now I can just uh, exit out of this. And now I can actually use the grid um, as a sort of shorthand, quick unit of measurement. So if I want to let's say make a make a rectangle that's four inches, uh, two inches by two inches or four inches by four inches. Um, I can actually just draw it on, on the grid if I wanted to. 
and there's my four inch by four inch rectangle. Um, and then, uh, so, so having this sort of grid is super useful. Um, another sort of useful trick that I'm going to show you, uh, now is, uh, how to actually get feedback on the dimension of something. So I've been hiding the bottom part of the window. Uh, let me not hide it for a second there. And maybe I'll move myself up here. So um, you can see right now um, I'm sort of almost at zero, zero. If you look down at these numbers over here. So if I were to just like do something where it's going to snap. So you can see now it's snapping at zero, zero, zero. That is useful to know. So you may want to keep an eye on the this little bit at the bottom right here um, because it is pretty useful. So um, I'm going to go ahead and also uh, sort of get this uh, into a place where maybe I m am ready to move it. And so I can actually just click and drag. And if I'm keeping an eye on the bottom there, Um, you can see that it's at four inches on the Y, which is good. So, so using, um, using those sort of units and using, um, the coordinate system, uh, as a kind of way of just na navigating and knowing where things are is super useful. So we're going to be, uh, doing that, uh, you know, off and on as we kind of draw stuff. So, um, I think that that is a good place to stop for today. Um, I think if you're sort of looking for things to do, uh, to kind of try out and get started with Rhino, I'll just recap a little bit. So I think, uh, probably a great place to start would be, uh, drawing, you know, a, a shape using one of the line tools or a solid, to one of the solid tools and just practicing with navigation for a few minutes. Um, I would also start just practice like drawing simple shapes like a rectangle or a polygon um, and get used to this sort of um, prompt system. So here it's saying, okay, where's the center of the polygon? Let's put it here. Number of sides. Well, we can change that. We can make that like nine because everybody loves an end gone. Um, and yeah, so, you know, you've basically got yourself a polygon. So just practice, practice, um, working with simple shapes and I'll see you all, uh, in, uh, in a few minutes, um, uh, for the next video. All right. Thanks.